10. The Meaning of the Resurrection Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 to 29 For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male or female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 to 29. In these verses, Paul stresses something very important to his statement of the gospel. For example, he tells us elsewhere, And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Colossians chapter 3 verse 10 Paul tells us that because of Jesus Christ's coming as our new Adam, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 to 50, we are a new man, a new creation, because Christ has destroyed the power of sin and death by his atonement and resurrection. No man can become a member of the new humanity except through Jesus Christ, his atonement, resurrection and regenerating power. We have no status before God in terms of our race, status, sex, or works. What Paul declares in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28, he says elsewhere also, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Romans chapter 10 verse 12 where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Colossians chapter 3 verse 11 In the place of human merits and elitism, God establishes status only in Jesus Christ, his resurrecting power and his saving grace. All are baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, so that we are now members of the new humanity in Christ. Before the sovereign grace of God, all human differences, however real, are as nothing. Because Christ has abolished the law of commandments as an indictment, a death sentence against us, it is nothing for him to render all human works and status null and void before the Father, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 18. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. The twain referred to in verse 15 are the Jews and the Gentiles. They were separate, hostile bodies, alike dead in trespass and sins, equally the children of wrath. They are created anew so as to become one body of which Christ is the head. They are one and they are new, that is, renewed. When Paul says that we are all one in Christ Jesus. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 28, he echoes John chapter 17 verse 21, chapter 10 verse 16, Romans chapter 12 verse 5, 
and 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 10. In every era, men seek to establish their elitist standards and make themselves into the gods of creation. The history of salvation records God's continuing action against this pretension. God deliberately smashes all these humanistic pretensions which rest on the tempter's premise of Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 that every man can be his own God and determine law and good and evil for himself. Paul states this clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 to 31. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The same fact is stated also by James, who tells us, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? James chapter 2 verse 5 Thus, the New Testament plainly opposes to man's elitism the death and resurrection of Christ. God reduces all man's efforts and pretensions to nothing and establishes his new creation on Jesus and his resurrection. Christ's resurrection, Paul tells the Corinthians, is the first fruits of the new creation. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. The problem in Corinth with respect to the resurrection was one of skepticism or unbelief. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 to 19. In Galatia there was a difference. Because of the influence of Pharisees within the church, the resurrection was not doubted, but its significance was not recognized. In either case, the resurrection, the central fact of all history, was reduced to meaninglessness or an isolated fact. Paul, however, stresses the meaning of the resurrection again and again by stressing its context. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul tells us that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. It is not a human potentiality, but a divine miracle. The meaning of the resurrection is powerfully set forth by Cornelius Van Til. The Greeks, Van Til points out, were ready to believe that great possibilities are inherent in the natural world. Aristotle had concerned himself with monstrosities as an aspect of natural potentiality in a cosmos which has apparently a measure of the accidental in it. The Greek mind thus was ready to consider the possibility of bodily resurrections as an aspect of our natural potential, while rejecting it as God's ordained purpose. As we have seen, Pinchus Lapid in The Resurrection of Jesus Christ, 1983, gives us the perspective of a modern Pharisee. For Lapid, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a fact of history, and no more. 
The Old Testament records at least one isolated instance of this kind of events. Why should Christ's resurrection have a cosmic meaning and the man resurrected in 2 Kings chapter 13 verses 20 to 22 have none? Under the influence of Phariseeism, the Galatians were ready to believe in the resurrection, but not in the meaning thereof. Paul tells the Galatians that Christ's death had as its purpose our redemption from sin and this present evil world. Chapter 1 verse 4, compare chapter 3 verse 11, verses 13 to 14. This redeeming and risen Christ is our source of grace. Chapter 1 verse 6. We are free men in Christ. Chapter 2 verse 4. Because we are made just or righteous before God, freed from the death penalty of the law and made a new creation. Chapter 2 verses 16 and 17. Verse 21. Chapter 3 verse 24. We are crucified with Christ, who is our representative and who makes atonement for us. Chapter 2, verse 20. Because Christ was crucified for us, we are crucified to the world. We live in terms of his new creation rather than the impulses of Adam's fallen humanity. Chapter 6, verses 14 to 16. The atonement and resurrection give us victory over sin and death and the freedom of the new creation. If we replace God's grace unto salvation with human works and elitism, we are fallen from grace, and Christ is become of no effect unto us. Chapter 5, verse 4. Paul therefore summons us to freedom in Christ's resurrection and new creation, saying, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Chapter 5, verse 1 In both Romans chapter 1, verse 17 and Galatians chapter 3, 11, Paul declares that the just shall live by faith. This living by faith is a resurrection life. It means that the world of the fall of Genesis chapter 3, verse 5 has been judicially sentenced by Christ's atonement and resurrection and we now have the mandate to reclaim all things for Christ. Christian Reconstruction is resurrection theology, and its foundation is the atonement. In the world of Adam and the fall, men seek to establish a paradise without God and a justice that denies God's justice. The result is the reign of death, the prevalence of frustration and envy, The hostility of this humanistic world order is directed against God. Psalm 2, verses 1 following, and his rule of law. As with Aristotle, all possibilities must be natural ones, which is another way of saying that only man can be God. Only from the natural, with man as its head, can there emerge the possibility of a just social order. No less than Paul, the humanist wants a world in which all are one, Galatians 3.28, but not in Christ. All are to be one in terms of man's autonomy and ultimacy. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is part of God's heavenly laughter, Psalm 2 verse 4, and the warning to the nations is very clear. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and he perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Psalm 2, verses 10 to 12.